Omówiono najważniejsze sprawy związane z dalszym rozwojem województwa i kraju. Detroit, the Motor City, known for being the home of Motown, the music company that put out more hits than Def Jam, Diana Ross and the Supremes, Marvin Gaye, Stevie Wonder, and so many more. Detroit was a place where you could always get a hit, and not always hits of music. Drugs were hits too. Early Detroit had many dependent on its thriving economy. General Motors and Ford supplied a great deal of its residents' finance. People worked, people were proud, and people got paid. An honest job brought about an honest dollar, surely a fair exchange in a changing world. And as with many other cities like Detroit, it had its fair share of racial prejudices. They too had days of song that sang, we shall overcome, no justice, no peace. Seen, seen all too familiar in cities with blacks all over America. There was war and despair. That would play a part in the making of the city's character. Drugs would also encompass some. Both dealers and users would really be the same. They would walk in the same circles, same paths. The money they got created an underground economy, one that gave a sense of pride. Little as be known to those who carried that pride, it was false. It was often disguised by illegally obtained prized possessions. Those that said, look at me, I'm so-and-so. The big man, okay. that nigga from Detroit. It's getting, it's getting, it's getting kind of heavy. Every time a little dog go cop from a Chevy, roll through the hoods that he knows so good, that he knows so well on every block. It's the hook that's so eliminated the facts. We work hard for the plaque. I'm black, my generation's pulling us back. Clack. I'm addicted to love, but you addicted to my grub. Addicted to my grub, but you addicted to cooks. Richard Carter Jr. comes to Elmwood Cemetery about once a month to visit the grave of his father, the drug kingpin, Maserati Rick, who ran a multi-million dollar crack cocaine and heroin empire on Detroit's east side. Maserati Rick was known across the country for driving flashy cars, wearing the finest clothes, and the most expensive jewelry, even hanging out with celebrities. So it's ironic that he has such a plain looking grave marker for a man who police say amassed millions of dollars. It's even more ironic when you consider that underneath this simple headstone is this, a $16,000 silver coffin built like a Mercedes Benz complete with spinning wheels. Detroit, 1967. To begin this story, you would first have to begin with the history of Detroit, the condition of the people and the mindset of one Maserati Rick a.k.a. Richard Carter. Next, we're going to turn to an anniversary. It was 40 years ago this week that Detroit erupted in flames, in riot. After five days, the city had seen some of the deadliest and most destructive rioting in U.S. history. More than 40 people died in the Detroit riots, 7,000 people were arrested, and at least 2,000 buildings burned to the ground. So what's happened to Detroit since? Well, a photographer who lived in Detroit at the time of those riots recently returned to his city to measure how much or how little progress the city has made in the last four decades. I'm Phil Turner and uh, I grew up in Detroit. I was uh, 16 years old, still in high school, when the city burned down around me. I'd never seen anything like it and I hope I never do again. There were uh, armed troops patrolling my neighborhood, jeeps going by with machine guns on them and soldiers in full battle dress. I took my camera and wandered through some of the affected neighborhoods. I developed the idea of going back and taking pictures of the same neighborhoods. I wanted to see how they might have changed or stayed the same. The shots on Pingree Street are probably the most graphic. All that was left there, a series of row houses, was the brickwork, a chimney and a staircase. Everything else was completely gone. The city has left this park there. There's a couple ball fields. We even saw some kids playing in it. The old staircase has been dismantled. The concrete steps are now stuck in the ground at an odd angle and used 
for kids to sit on while they play baseball. Another picture is uh, on a street called Grand River and an intersection of Lysander. There's an old furniture store on the corner. We couldn't find any trace of this intersection at first. Not only was the building gone, it was just an empty field. If you look at the old black and white picture, there's a very distinctive street lamp. Street lamp's still there. I don't know if it works. There were times during the riot where it was too dangerous for firemen to try to put out fires. So things just burned. And when it was all over, there wasn't a whole lot left. It was really living in a battle zone. Checkpoints, tanks, fellas in helmets with uh, M1s over their shoulder. It was scary. There's one kid walking down the block, and I think there's a cat walking through the picture at the same time. And for me, it just emphasized that this wasn't just a ruin and it wasn't just a fire. It was somebody's neighborhood. These were people's houses. One minute they were living at home, and the next minute they were completely out on the street. And, and I don't know that the city's ever recovered from that trauma. Yeah, hey, it's all right. I want y'all to know that. At the time of the 67 riots, a young Richard Carter would witness the atrocities that would burn not only his neighborhood, but the images would be burned into his brain. On a normal day in July of 67, police executed a raid on an after-hours spot in a predominantly black neighborhood. Expecting to arrest a small handful of people, to their surprise, was 82 people who celebrated the return of two Vietnam vets. Overwhelmed, the police arrested and kicked out patrons. Of those not arrested and kicked out, some tried to find shelter elsewhere. Elsewhere was next door, and upon entering, the police considered that breaking in. All hell would break loose. There would be looting and chaos for five days. 43 people would die. 1,189 would be injured and 7,000 would be arrested. Detroit would hold the history as rich as Alabama, Texas, or a dozen other cities in the South. Detroit would also move on and rebuild. Part of its rebuilding process would be building a new breed of black, illegal, fearless, with names like Butch Jones, Demetrius Holloway, the Chambers Brothers, and of course, Maserati Rick. There was a history with gangsters that ran parallel to the racial problems, and within those waters, they ran deep. Butch Jones, man, the YBI. That's one of the biggest ones, man, from, you know, hearing them back in the days, how much money they was getting, uh, right. driving all of the hottest cars and all that, man. You feel me? Right. Real, you know, tight organization and whatnot. YBI was one of them, man. Uh, then I hear another brother, man, Demetrius Holloway. Okay. Uh, we hear also, I should have said this about before, uh, Sylvester Seal Murray, okay. you know, had some ties with the YBI. Uh, of course, we heard about the Maserati Rick. You know, some of the, these were some of the major cats out here out of Detroit, man. They got a whole lot more, man. But one thing about Detroit, man, you know, it's, it's, a, you know, it's like a Detroit code. You know, a lot of people keep real quiet about a lot of shit out here. You know what I'm saying? Right. You yes, feel sir. me? Yes, Detroit uh, narcotics scene goes back probably about 100 years right now, um, as documented. Uh, early part of the 20th century, you had a lot of the bootlegging gangs that, although their primary... Uh, primary product was the bootlegging of alcohol, they made money and the devil on the side of narcotics. Uh, groups like the Italians, uh, the East Side and West Side gangs, as well as the Purple Gang, which was a Jewish mob syndicate that uh, worked in conjunction with the Italians. Uh, when Prohibition was over, uh, a lot of the bootleg bootleggers and, and uh, uh, booze, booze barons had to find new ways of making money. So between around 1930 to around the mid-1960s, uh, all narcotics being brought into Detroit were controlled by the Italian Mafia. Um, even the uh, uh, black dealers that were dealing on the streets throughout the 40s, 50s, and 60s were all being supplied by the Italians. Uh, around the early 1960s, Detroit had its first uh, unquestioned urban crime lord uh, uh, a black uh, police officer who was kicked off the force, uh, a man by the name of Henry Marzet, who went by the nickname Blaze. Uh, Blaze Marzet was 
a highly decorated undercover police, uh, undercover narcotics police officer who was the youngest uh, Detroit police officer ever to reach 100 uh, drug collars and had uh, worked undercover in the drug syndicate uh, uh, in the, the urban neighborhoods of Detroit from the early 1950s until he was busted uh, shaking down some drug dealers and dealing in some narcotics himself around 1958, I believe. Uh, he served about a two or three year prison sentence and reemerged on the streets of Detroit in the early 1960s and started to consolidate his own organization uh, as well as fly out to uh, Asia a la Frank Lucas, an American gangster, and uh, arrange his own supply line that was uh, in, in competition with uh, the Italian Mafia and started getting their own supply source. Uh, 1978, a man by the name of Bilton, uh, excuse me, a man by the name of Milton Butchie Jones was released from Jackson State Prison after serving a, uh, a, a sentence, I believe it was for an attempted murder, um, came out of jail and uh, created a, a very powerful drug syndicate in 1978 that became to, became to be known, that came to be known as YBI or Young Boys Incorporated. Uh, Bushy Jones, along with Lieutenants uh, Raymond, Baby Ray Peoples, and uh, Mark uh, Big Block Marshall, as well as Dwayne, Wonderful Wayne Davis, also known as WW, uh, were the four uh, main uh, leaders of the YBI who uh, helped, as I said, Frank Nitty Usher and, and Harold Morton from Murderers Row um, develop their own contacts out of New York uh, for a supply line as opposed to going through the Italians. At that point, the Italians were almost completely cut out of, cut out of the, the drug trade by the late 70s, and the Detroit Urban uh, Crime Syndic was almost completely uh, you know, self-contained and uh, getting their own, you know, having their own supply sources. Uh, the government came in uh, in 1983, I believe, 1982 or 1983, and levied a, a very wide-scale indictment of uh, the YBI. Uh, over 50 members um, were taken down in that bust. Uh, the remaining uh, remaining members, uh, partially led by Butch Jones's wife, Portia, a woman by the name of Portia Sturdivant, um, continued uh, the, the tradition of YBI for the next couple years uh, with you know Butch giving instruction from behind uh, prison bars and uh, they were brought down in 1985. At that point, you had a large uh, void to be filled. You know, the, 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 the area and the country were coming out of an economic recession. People wanted to get high. People wanted to live uh, lavishly. And there was a huge, uh, a huge chasm that, uh, that needed to be filled. And there were you know, more, than, you know, more than a few people in this area that were willing to fill it. Uh, around that time, you also had a man by the, a man by the name of Demetrius Holloway who was uh, coming out of prison after serving a five-year sentence for armed robbery, I believe. Holloway had been a protege of uh, Frank Usher and Harold Morton in uh, the Murder Row Syndicate. Um, Holloway, along with uh, his partner, a man by the name of Maserati, uh, Maserati Rick Carter, Richard Maserati Rick Carter, um, carved out a piece of the city and took it for themselves. The piece of the city they carved was Detroit's east side poverty and despair for some and a way of escape for others. Some would get high while others would get rich. I mean, the East Side is like, it is like a community of like, uh, so many different parts of the East Side. There's like Mac, Gratiot, Chalmers, then it's like uh, over there by Out of Drive and Ryan and all that, there's many different sides to the east side. With my dude, you know, with Maserati Rick goes to the situation is the east side of Detroit, where he came from. The east side is the coldest motherfucking hood in the city of Detroit, period. And when you look at through the world, Detroit is one of the most dangerous cities in the world. So if you take the context of if Detroit is one of the most dangerous cities in the world, and then you got the east side, the most dangerous motherfuckers uh, hood in Detroit, what that tell you? That's where this dude grew up from. That's where I've come from. The east side is, is dangerous in the motherfucker. With the climate of the east side being what it was, what it is, one would have to question what one would do. How to feed his family, 
how to live. Shit, just how to survive. Maserati Rick would come up with an answer, and his answer would be stealing cars. Well, when I was coming up, I was about 13, 14. Before he became Maserati, he was a little smooth ladies' man, draped up, hanging out with Tommy now. Old Queens on Hopper. I was a little bitty fella. You was real little bitty. And, uh, it was just cabin, stealing cars. They was just popping cars and making money off that. And he used to go out and steal cars, man. And, and um, the police would come knock on our door and ask for him. And go to the room and arrest him and walk him out the door. It's like, it's like they knew who he was. Practice makes perfect, and in order to be a good car thief, Rick would first need something to drive. My brother would decide to let Rick drive his car. The next thing you know, my brother lost his car. The front end was in these people's basement across the street. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. The front end of the car was uh, across the street in, in, in these people's basement. And my mama grabbed Rick, just got the beat his ass. And uh, she was like, motherfucker, you gonna do it again? You gonna do it again? And Rick was like, no, I, mama, I swear, I ain't gonna never do it again. So she was whooping him, and she hit him across the ear with the belt. And, and, and Rick was like, Mom, I can't hear no more. I can't hear no more. So she said, you can do it again. Rick said, no. She said, God damn it, I thought you couldn't hear no more. <laughs> <laughs> Man. And he, just, and he was also smart and, and le like, like electricity type shit, man. Because he one day, you know, he, he had a bed. Like, he lay on one side of the bed. The license call the the room the license in his room would come on and he'd on the other side all the lights and the TV all that shit would go off. And uh he used to go out and find broke uh, TVs and shit out in the yard. So so out out people go on, he'll fix them up and resell them. It's just a he, he was just a smart, intelligent, funny type of person. Rick was a hustler all his life. I mean, Rick would walk down the street and find a toy and fix it and then sell it to me. I, I remember all the way back where I uh, was with little bitty kids, where I was like 10 years old. Rick was like maybe 14. And when my mom would be like, uh, then I tell you, wash the dishes. And he'd be like, here, my hand $20. And he'd be like, Greg, you or Bo washed them damn dishes. And Rick go to the house party. And I'm like, what the hell? I ain't supposed to be washing dishes tonight. But it's a payoff. And that's what he knew all his life. Pay ask somebody off. Give me some money. And I'm, a, I'm, I'm tearing people off. Tearing people off in the streets is defined as payment but it could also mean tearing a nigga's ass up. A trait only the strong knew, and one of the strongest Rick knew and protected was Tommy Hitman Hearns. Rick would be his bodyguard, although he was a smaller man, he would tear you off, Detroit style, which in English meant murder. His relationship would also carry to none other than Sugar Ray Leonard. This association with the top dogs of the boxing world would welcome him into their world, and with his welcome, he managed none other than his brother. I was a professional boxer also. Rick was my manager. I just sat down with people that well, we sat down and we talked about hundreds of thousands, of, hundreds of thousands, hundreds, not just 100, hundreds of thousands. And I'm like, what the fuck? I didn't think this was possible coming from where I grew up at. I mean, the government cheese, where well, we had to slash the shit, the shit just be this thick. I didn't think shit like this happened. But Rick made it happen. And Rick was like, uh, 
Greg, you want to start, start fighting again? I'm like, I knew what all the money was at in the family. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and like I said, he, he was my higher power. Whatever I wanted, I could call him and get it. And uh, when I decided back in 88, 87, that I was start fighting again, he was like, okay, well, I'm finna do this, I'm about to do this, I'm about to do this, I'm about to do this. I mean, I'm talking about contracts, I mean, million dollar fighters. He had the contracts already. Million dollar contracts from a soon to be, but non million dollar nigga was made possible because of Rick's circle. The circle, however, was a circle that first became a straight line. The kind of line many would get into with a pulse that would monitor death. This is Channel 7 Action News Brief, brought to you by Mervyn's Department Store. Here's reporter Bill Bonds. Community leaders meeting to try to formulate a plan to beat the crack cocaine problem in Detroit and all the crime associated with it. But Mayor May Young may not take the drastic steps he was talking about taking last night. The latest on that story at 11. It's 83, and the drug game is in the first quarter. Coach Crack has his players playing straight off the poor people's bench. The opposing team fights back with the intent to finish them. And for every player fouled, one replaces him. Amongst the replacements are three players, experienced but amateur and ready to make the pros. Maserati Rick, Demetrius Holloway, and white boy Rick Wershey. Together, their team would be known as best friends. The best friends would only be friends for so long. As fate would have it, there would be conflicts amongst them that would eventually lead to murder. A rivalry had developed between Demetrius and Maserati. Roshi would be drama free between the two as he was necessary because he was to connect the needed player for the network to grow. Maserati and Demetrius, however, competed for the same thing. Who was number one? Maserati, not one for second place, had learned never to be second during his days as a heroin dealer. And like any man, he would be protective of his woman. The streets was talking, and one of the things said was Demetrius was on the creek with a Maserati-branded female companion. This would only complicate the organization and its profits. In addition to the everyday drug dealer bullshit in politics, there would be contests amongst the best friends members. Contests so big in fact, they would actually name Richard Carter, AKA Maserati Rick. Maserati Rick came about, uh, he was like the youngest black man in Detroit with a Marvel right. He had it at, I believe he had it at the age of 25. But his first car, his first car was a Benz. He used to steal cars. From what I understand, his nickname derived from, uh, I think him, well, from what I am, from the stories I've heard, uh, him and Demetrius and a couple other guys uh, around, uh, you know, 84, 85, it kind of developed an a, a ongoing jovial rivalry of who could you know come up with the fattest ride you know the, the car that had you know, with the most tripped out car you know one day Demetrius would roll up in a, in a Benz and Rick would have to come up the next day with a, with a you know a flashier Benz or a, or, or, a, or a Beamer or, or, or what have you but one day Maserati you know said you know screw this I'm gonna just gonna top them all and he, he went uh, somewhere I, I heard Ohio but I don't know maybe it was somewhere around here and he got a Maserati and rolled up on these people at a, at a club one day and was just like, it's over with, baby, I win, I'm Maserati Rick. And as a joke, they started to call that night, they were like, Maserati Rick, Maserati Rick. It kind of started off as a joke, but it just kind of stuck. Um, and it's funny because I think a lot of people think the nickname is because, you know, my, uh, Rick Carter could always be seen in a Maserati. Well, I don't think that's true. From what I understand, he preferred Mercedes Benz's. Uh, but just that one time where he showed up and, and wanted to, you know, top everyone and, you know, and win the contest of who can be had the flashiest ride, uh, you know, kind of garnered that nickname and it really stuck with him. And as a result, you know, kind of even, 
elevated his, his legacy that was, you know, already, you know, growing. The legacy that would grow would grow partially because of the flash. But what would propel his name was his associations, drugs, and murders. The Detroit of Maserati's day was violent, and a reputation of then was based on work, real work, the murder game. And at that time, there were a few who did it better. Rock and Reggie Brown, Ed Hansard, and Maserati himself. These few would mix, and at some point, the mixture would go deadly wrong. Ed Hansard and Maserati had knew each other and had several dealings prior to their relationship turning sour. Different sources blamed the sourness on different reasons, territory, jealousy, or simply outgrowing each other. Maserati had already made heroin money, real money, several million dollars. Ed Hansard had made his too, but his leaned more towards Coke. With the Coke of Ed's and the dope of Maserati, they played exactly like the mix in the bloodstream of a fiend, speedballing. And with the speedball effect in the system of both, there would be fights. There were several street reported scenes of turmoil, but on one climactic day, in front of Maserati's car wash, there would be war. September of uh, 1988, uh, in front of one of Rick's, Maserati Rick's um, car washes that he owned, uh, one of Ed Hansard's got, uh, men, one of his soldiers, one of his hit, uh, enforcers or bodyguards, and Ed had kind of created his own little army, a uh, man by the name of Lodrick, uh, the hitman Parker, uh, alleged to be, uh, alleged to be Lodrick hitman Parker. Uh, came up on uh, uh, Maserati Rick and uh, shot him a couple times. I know he got him in the stomach. Uh, Rick shot, shot this guy. So the guy pulled up at, at a car wash. And uh, the guy shot Rick in the stomach. Rick shot him. And uh, both of them went to the hospital. With Rick shot but alive in the hospital, time would be his enemy. His attacker would lay doors down, wounded as he was, but his attacker would be alive the next day. According to hospital officials, 29-year-old Richard Carter of Northwest Detroit, Detroit didn't, didn't make, make it, it this time. time. Officials say two men were seen near his room when the shooting was discovered. Really, we don't have a whole lot of details other than the fact that um, some people saw two men. Anybody can visit patients, and there was no restrictions um, on visiting this patient. There are sometimes restrictions imposed by patients or the police department, etc., and there were no restrictions on this patient. This is the first time in the hospital's 50-year history there has been a shooting inside. Officials say after today, they plan to reevaluate their security measures. A family member who did not want to appear on camera said Carter was shot on Friday while washing his car. She said she spoke to him this morning on the telephone and he said he couldn't identify who shot him. News of the shooting upset visitors who came to the hospital located at Outer Drive and Schaefer Road. They were banned from visiting patients on the third floor for the rest of the night. How, what, who, or should we know? Because we're security, how does that happen? Where's security? How does that happen is a good question. At the time of Rick's death, he had several feuds. Ed Hanship was one, and then there was also one with his one-time friend, Demetrius Holloway. 
couldn't have been nobody like Ed and them motherfuckers. You see what I'm saying? It had to be big, bigger than that. You see what I'm saying? Because them niggas were small time. How you gonna get past the police and go in the hospital and hit somebody? Huh? Come on now. You can't get past them polices unless it was a big time. Let them motherfuckers pass. You see what I'm saying? I mean, if, if you got a chance to get somebody, yeah, I agree, yeah, you get them. Get them while you can. Because they going to get you while they can. It just so happened they caught him. And they caught him slipping. What can I say? It's, that's the game. I, to me, that was a coward move, personally. It's, you in the hospital, you recovering from a, a bully. How can you, you know, it, it was a coward move. You know, okay. It, it, you know, that's not how you... Nah, that was, that was weak. Rick had done a lot of things in his short life. From his days of a boy witnessing the fires that destroyed Detroit, to becoming a drug dealer hobnobbing with superstars. Yeah, Rick had done it. He had found the way so many inner city urban niggas find. The way we all know the ending to, but say fuck it and do it anyway. Rick was one of a million anybodies who would choose his own path and end up dead as a nobody. But that wouldn't be Rick. Uh-uh. Even in death, he had other plans. Rick used to always tell Mama Betty, right here, Betty Carter, you remember, uh, did y'all get that on the picture, Betty? He used to always tell her, shut up, Mama, you don't worry about it. When I'm dead, you will have money. You see what I'm saying? Remember, you used to always tell her when she be like, you selling that dope and shit? And he, Wait, man, I don't want to hear it, mama. You're going to be all right. Don't worry about that, you know? He ain't want to go out like that. He used to tell her to burn it. He, he, he used to say cremate. You see what I'm saying? That's all I can remember. Because one day we was upstairs and he came in. And uh, Betty was like, y'all need to go to church. Y'all need to tell me to take your ass to church. And Because uh, she was a Christian lady. She used to always tell us to go to church and Rick, but don't worry about me. You gonna be all right. Something happened to me. Don't even worry about it. Just ah ah. Did you pay that insurance? <laughs> He's always reminded. Did you pay that insurance? I never think that my brother be buried in Mercedes Pants. I know what I'm saying. Cause he 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 always had a Mercedes. He was like, at 25, he was the first young black person with a Maserati at 25. But he always had Mercedes. And the way he went out, the way he lived, his lifestyle. He lived to do everything he wanted to do. He traveled out the country. He bought everything he wanted to have. But he never got to see his children grow up. He didn't, he didn't sell out. He didn't let nobody run over him. You know what I'm saying? And yes, he was the gangster. He went out like one and he lived like one. Regardless of what everybody say, you know, people talk, the streets talk, but he definitely lived the real gangster's life and everybody, everybody knows. And as far as I'm concerned, he was a good guy to me. I ain't never know nothing bad about him. It's just the way they did him. That was some bold shit. It was fucked up, you know. Cause he could have went out any other kind of way. He shouldn't have got took out. Cause he was a helper. He used to help a lot of people, you know. That's all I remember. He used to always help people. Rick wasn't a bad person.
With the death of Maserati Rick, shit in Detroit was up for grabs. There would be numerous murders in record numbers. Dudes knew money was waiting to be made and nobody was willing to stand in line to get it. Ed Hansford was still calling shots, but he was now facing numerous charges from the feds. Nevertheless, business continued. Rick's one-time partner, Demetrius Holloway, was still around as well, and his pockets put on some weight. Well, I think some people, uh, like in any situation like that, uh, like you said, there were definitely a, a lot of mourners, people that, that, that he worked with and that respected him and loved him, but then there were also people that saw it as an opportunity for themselves to, again, fill a void that was created, and uh, I think they thought with the end of Maserati, that meant the end of Demetrius Holloway, um, and that was a big, big, big business, a big chunk of, big chunk of the city that needed to be supplied. So I think a lot of people saw it as an opportunity to come in and um, make a name for themselves in the same way that Maserati Demetrius had made a name for themselves. The one-time Best Friends organization was all but dismantled, but there were still rumors and whispers in the streets. Sources say orders had come down to eliminate the Maserati era. No one knows for sure if these orders were the result of another organization or from a nigga like Ed Hansard, the prime suspect in Maserati Rick's murder. What is known, however, for sure, is the events that took place in broad daylight Monday, October 8th, 1990. Ironically, not ironically, incidentally, um, about two or three years later, Demetrius Holloway, um, was killed in, in similar fashion uh, when he was gunned down uh, uh, at the Broadway, a popular um, urban clothier in uh, downtown Detroit. He was talking to the uh, talking to the uh, one of the salespeople uh, with a girl to, with a girl to his right, and someone came up from behind him, put a gun to the back of his head, and pulled the trigger. Um, from what I understand, uh, there were some people that uh, affiliated with Ed Hansard and possibly affiliated with uh, Rock and Reggie Brown. Um, from the best friends that uh, basically had a beef with Holloway because he was still around and uh, they wanted to you know, get rid of that entire uh, conglomerate that uh, was Maserati Rick and Demetrius Holloway and take over their territory. So in a matter of two years, and you know, two very violent um, and high profile murders, uh, they were able to do that. The shots that cut down Demetrius Holloway were reminiscent of some movie type shit. Academy Award winning murder, one shot, one kill, all that slick street shit played until this very day. Maserati dead, Holloway dead, and Rick Wershey a rat, forever sealed best friends, and planted seeds that would plague Detroit with murder. All the hairstyles, gators, and fancy cars wouldn't remove its murderous past, a past that repeats itself on a daily. Is Detroit the most dangerous city in America? New Crime Report says yes, but Detroit isn't taking the news laying down. Detroit got a serious history of being like a murder capital. A lot of people think about Detroit as being something new, as being the number one murder capital. Detroit and New Orleans, Detroit been a murder capital. Around here, it's the attitude like, you know, even if I knuckle up with a nigga right now, you know what I'm saying? If I whoop him, niggas around here attitude be, I'm killing that nigga when I see him. You know what I'm saying? So, shit. Sometimes it be like that, you know what I mean? But I think that everybody just set in their ways. I don't like to, you know, you can't blame nobody for nobody else's actions, you know what I'm saying? So, like, I just think that, you know, it's just rough around here, you know what I'm saying? And, like, we don't, around in, in Detroit, man, they don't really gang bang, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, it's, it's a neighborhood thing here, you know? It's, I'm from the east side, I'm from the west side, I'm from Joy Road, I'm from Schoolcraft, I'm from Linwood, I'm from Seven Mile, you know what I mean? I feel like, you know, it's a lot of dudes that's misunderstood out here, you know what I'm saying? I feel like we've always had, you know, like some salt, like a bad, you know what I'm saying? On just when you hear Detroit or you see a lot of times see a nigga in the D hat, you know what I mean? Even when I'm out telling you, oh, you from Detroit, you know what I'm saying? The history of Detroit drugs is, is crazy. I mean, you got where like crack started and cocaine and, and all of that situation started. They had a really strong movement on the city of Detroit and the epidemic on Detroit. We were some of the first people. We always grew up on fashion, so the gators and, and, the, and the serious chains and all that type of stuff was something that we thrive for. I mean, 
So when cocaine came in and when crack came in, it was like a crazy game. And the history of with Detroit is not only is it one area of drugs, you got heroin been here since the 70s. You got fucking the best weed been here since the 70s. Any nigga with a bag can get it off in the city of Detroit. Any nigga. And everybody has been affiliated with drugs in Detroit, from the police to the mayor to the streets to the teachers to everybody has had something to do with drugs in the city of Detroit. Drugs in Detroit seem to go hand in hand. The profits and proceeds created staggering wealth and exasperated its legal system. One out of every three young black males have at one time or another had its brush with the law. Ironically, the law and its government seem to run parallel with the illegalities of the city, Detroit City. The corruption of Maserati Rick's day has progressed until today, and one of Detroit's main illegal progressors was its mayor, Kwame Kilpatrick. Tonight on Nightline, Motor City Scandal. Sex and politics intertwine in a mess that's cost a struggling city millions of dollars. Did the mayor fire this police officer for blowing the whistle? The truth is in the text messages. From the global resources of ABC News, with Terry Moran, Martin Bashir, and Cynthia McFadden, this is Nightline, February 27, 2008. Good evening. Tonight, sex, lies, and politics. This is the story of a young public official filled with high hopes and good intentions for a troubled city. Just last month, Forbes magazine described Detroit as the most miserable city in America. It has the nation's highest rate of violent crime, the highest rate of foreclosures, and the mayor of Detroit was determined to serve his city well. Until, that is, he used millions of dollars in public funds to try and keep secret his private life. Today, the extent of his cover-up was revealed in court, and the whistleblowers spoke exclusively to Nightline's Vicki Mabry. Yeah, I didn't get on my knees and pray to God to get this position, to disrespect my God, my wife, and my children in our home. It was quintessential Kwame Kilpatrick, Detroit's, Detroit's brash um, young mayor. I don't whore around on my wife. And Back I don't in 2003, parties, denying rumors that he'd had an affair now, and fired police officers to cover it up. And I can't wait till the truth comes out. It's time for all of us to rise up. To rise up. To rise up. Mayor Detroit is a, a confounding mix of qualities. He's energetic. He's a great uh, salesperson on behalf of the city of Detroit. On the other hand, the mayor of Detroit also has a tendency to make really poor, really poor personal choices. And the situation we're in right now is an example of that. The situation involved rumors of infidelity and a wild party with strippers at the mayor's mansion as well as allegations of abuses by his police bodyguards, charges that they were an elite protection squad run amok. The mob, the Sopranos. Harold Nelthrop, a 17-year police veteran, was one of the bodyguards in that unit. The accusations that would accompany the mayor would run concurrent with the city's long list of mobsters. Butch Jones, Maserati Rick, BMFs, Big Meech, all well-organized units who at one time or another probably pleaded to God to get off. So it's amazing why Kilpatrick thought he'd do some of the same things and get off. Yeah, I didn't get on my knees and pray to God to get this position, to disrespect my God and my wife and my children in our home. And I can't wait until the truth comes out. Everybody's truth is different, but ultimately, in the end, it's their truth. One thing, however, makes all truths the same, jail and being guilty. I lied under oath in the case of Gary Brown and Harold Nelson versus the city of Detroit. Case number 03317557NZ regarding information that was relevant to claims made by Gary Brown and Harold Nelson. I did so with an intent to mislead the court and the jury and to impede and obstruct that impede and obstruct the fair administration of justice. I lied under oath at a civil disposition, deposition for the brown Nelthrop lawsuit on October 11, 2004 in the city of Detroit. I also lied under oath in the civil jury trial in the Nelthrop brown lawsuit in the Wayne County Circuit Court on August 29, 2007.
Kwame Kilpatrick's case is just one example of history repeating itself, being recast in a suit. But just like Maserati Rick, he was cast as a criminal, and although criminal is wrong, they are not to be forgotten. They are stories cast where memories are triggered allowing one to replay a minute in time and remember an event. In Rick's brother's case, he remembers the pain associated with asking Rick for some money, not knowing he lay dead in the hospital. The most painful thing is the death because it, it hurts me. It's like this. And it really hurt me because it's like I thought he was invincible. I didn't think he could die. Not at that age. And it really hurts me because when I called him, I was calling him about Somali. It wasn't about I love you. It wasn't about bro, get well. It was about bro, I need a couple of dollars. And it hurt me real bad. And, and, and that's really fucked up because I was a grown man and where I can get out and do what I want to when I want to like I do today. And it just hurts that I was calling him about some money and not calling him about is you all right? And when I made that phone call, the phone call didn't go through because he was dead already. He was already dead and uh, there's many phone calls I could have made to other people. But I wanted to call him to ask him how he was doing and none of that shit. suit on, like, no, nah, I don't want you in it, man, keep working, you know, I couldn't never get a hold of nothing, so, you know, I laid back. His death was like, I mean, I, I wouldn't say I would rather him have died, but I think it's 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 more of a um, it's more comfortable, I would say, sense of comfort because he in a better place instead of being on the streets.